Hey everybody, this is Captain Gun. Jack and Daxter. Yeah, it's a good series. Well, I do prefer Ratchet and Clank. Jack and Daxter still holds up, and since the rest of the games have finally come out on PS4, I think they're worth taking a look at. Even though I know that the PS4 version has a few bugs, it's still better than a PS2 disc on. So, look at that picture. This seems like a 180 degree turn. Jack is a goat and a fucking gun. This really seems quite a bit edgy, but hey, I've already started with you, so why would I back up now? And without further ado, here's the game and everything. The game picks up right after the secret ending in the last game. The life was some kind of precursor ring and some machine. And Kira has set this up. And Jack, Daxter, same as Kira, sit in the thing for some reason. Jack and Daxter messes around with it. And out of the ring comes first these things and then this thing. The gang launch into the rift. And then they end up some weird futuristic place called Haven City. Which is the game's main area. Uh, Kira and Samus aren't with us. Only, da only Jack and Daxter are there. Kinda weird. But when they enter this place, some guards from the Crimson Guard, being led by this dude, called Errol, knocks Jack down and doesn't care enough to chase Daxter down, which leads into his own spin-off game. Two years go by and Jack is shown being experimented on by Dark Nico. Errol is here and this guy enters the scene. This guy is Baron Praxis, the ruler of Haven City. He and Errol go for the Swalter Beach as Daxter arrive to see Jack stuck. It's then we get to see Jack's new abilities. Say something! Just this one! I'm gonna kill Praxis! No, oh, for some reason being experimented on by Dark Eco gave good old Jack over here some fully capable vocal cords. However, he gets stretched by Dexter, and since this is the first time he's able to say anything, he won't take this anymore! He turns into some beast with claws, but he's quickly turned back to normal. So that's the thing, Jack gets some clothes from Daxter and together they escape from the fortress. When these fine gentlemen escape, we can clearly notice a few differences. The setting is different, and the precursor orbs, which was the currency in the last game, have become quite hard to find. These are so rare that they are just used to get some sheets. I didn't use any, but hey, guess that's neat. Jack and Daxter escapes the fortress, but they quickly meet an old man named Kor. Kor and Vistula get basically running from the gods, and the gods attack Jack and Daxter. Jack quickly disposes of them, but not without turning into Edgy Saiyan. So, let's discuss this. Because of the Dark Eco experiments, Jack can turn into his Dark Eco form. This reduces damage taken, improves physical attack speeds, and makes you have the ability to do some super moves. Oh, we're gonna get them. This sounds neat, but just to say it, you won't be used this much. I'll go into why later, but for now I'll just roll with it. Kor tells Jack to look for some guy named Torn, who's working for some underground resistance held bent over from the Baron. We go over and get a task. Hmm, that was easy. We just have to go to Dead Town and collect the flag. The biggest difference compared to the first game is that this game is more mission based. Due to this, a lot of people have drawn a comparison to GTA, and they wouldn't be wrong for doing it. You can kill people on the streets, there's a wanted status, and you can even jack over people's zoomers. Oh, talking about zoomers, they make a return. However, instead of being used to collect things, we use it to go between places within Haven City. Haven City is a big place, so I'm at the very least grateful for the inclusion. The zoomer comes in different shapes. You have the one-seaters from the first game, you have a two-seater, a three-seater, a one-seater KG zoomer, and a multi-seater KG zoomer. They can switch between hover zones, the one-seaters are faster, the bigger ones are more tanky, and the KG zoomers have even built-in weapons. However, to the down! We do some platforming, and the cutscene that ensues is a metaphor for this game. We get back to enter another mission, this time on the beach slash pumping station. It's here we may encounter the first breed of metalheads. The metalheads are also the main baddies in the game. There are many forms which all behave differently. I won't go too much into those, but for some of them you'll need some special things. We'll get it in 30 minutes or at most. Anyways, we complete that and we start another mission. We break into the fortress and we get chased by this tank. It can be annoying, but that's only if you aren't used to the controls at this point. We get to the end of the mission, where we discover that the Baron and the Millheads are working together. The KG give the Millheads eco, and the tank is turned on, leading into somewhat of a funny scene. Actually, when talking about it, the cutscenes are a bit smoother than before. Character models look less pointy, men looking at Daxter, and there's a lot more effective comedy. I never really got a laugh out of the first game, but there's at the very least about two jokes that most people will find funny in this game. They even at banjos! Banjo just make everything better. I think. 
Okay, we did that mission. We got a pass which allows us to go into a certain part of the city. This is how the game opens up to you. You'll get more passes throughout the story. And now that we got the pass, we can put it to use in our next mission. We're driving a Zoomer with an illegal package into one of the sections that are open up. The port. And for the most of it, we are in the vaulted state. And since I'm so much better than everyone that plays this game, I didn't even feel it once. <laughs> we go in to meet this game's crime lord, Crew. He's a bit of a chubby fucker and in a hover chair or whatever this is. We ask him about why the metalhead gets eco from the KG, and Crew says, oh, Bitch, I own you now! And gives us a gun. A very special gun, in fact. This is the Morph Gun, which is a gun that changes its attributes depending on the mod attached. Much like the security passes, we get mods throughout the story. There are quite a few mods. They are the ones which adds perks to other mods, like the rate of fire upgrade or the damage upgrade, but the more interesting ones are the ones which changes the guns we have. For example, we start off with the Scarab Gun. The Scarab Gun is a shotgun, which is mostly helpful for dealing with enemies which take one hit to kill, or for enemies in a crowd. Later on we get the blaster, which is a long range rifle, and is by far the most helpful gun in the game. It does a decent amount of damage, it has a small aura lock, and you can do some combos with it which makes the game a bit easier. Then there's the Vulcan Barrel, which is a gun that does a bit less damage than blaster, but has a useful rate of fire, which will be useful in the few summer missions in the game. Lastly, we have the Peacemaker, which is kinda like the plasma cord from Russian Clank. You fire it, then things go dead. One detail I find very clever is the color of the guns. We reflect the eco from the last game and, well, this game to some extent. The scarab gun is like the red eco, which was short range. The blaster is like the yellow eco, which was long range. The Vulcan barrel fires fast, like how the blue eco granted extra speed. And the peace mercury is powerful and has a certain range, which is kind of like the special moves we use when in dark jack mode. And yeah, we also have health pickups, which are green, of course, like green eco. Anyway, we go to the gun course and practice use the morph gun. Okay. Now we go back to the pumping station and kill a few animals, it's a, a strong variant. Sick got his peacemaker early, probably axe, and he needs to charge it up in order to kill the animals. However, he needs to charge it up, which is something as far as I know, is not something we are able to do when we ourselves get the peacemaker. We can keep the charge, but it doesn't deal extra damage. It would have been nice with some consistency, guys. Someone inform me of that, please, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> When Sig charges the weapon, we need to shoot the enemies that swarms us. We finish that mission, and that's when the Dark Jack special moves comes into play. Remember the oracles from the first game, which charge you way too many precursor orbs for power cells? When you kill a certain metalhead for the first time, just uh, remember that you can die and kill it again, you get a skull gem. Use the skull gems in order to get the last resort moves. The first one is the Dark Bomb, which is a move where you punch the ground and damage nearby enemies. The second one is Dark Strike, where you force choke nearby enemies. The third one makes Dark Jack tank all damage from them, and the fourth one makes him go edgy saying Berserk. Uh, I don't know, legendary edgy saying. Oh, whatever is better. These abilities may sound like they're quite a bit useful, but they're not really that useful. There are certain areas where it's useful, but most of the time the guns and a regular punch is more effective, and they're not used in any platform sense, which is a shame. They did take this and some of the elements that need refining into consideration while making Jack free, but we need to firstly complete this review. Crew has an over task for us, and this involves destroying some cage turrets in the Haven sewers. We do get some info out of the crew, and what this says amounts to the bad guy needs its eye. We encounter some male heads. Like this one. Hey, we need jump scares in the edge because Nardog really hates more children. Why else would it be a 12 plus rating? We destroy the turrets and get the blaster. Crew sends us away again. Again? To get the race or something. Crew gives us a security pass where we get to the stage gem, where we meet Kira. What? You could hear it in the voice. And I thought I could have bad hearing at times. Just look at Jack here. Anyway, we get to test out the jet board. And Kira is just rude. But she does say that we can get up the better spells if we turn on the power for an out of place elevator. Why would we ever consider getting up there? Well, Jack doesn't really have any other purpose now than killing the Baron, so okay. Crew tells us to get money backs. We do it. However, this chick that made a two second appearance before is spying on Crew. Because Torn is a paranoid fuck. This is Tess, which is apparently someone who got the hots for Dexter. And it's okay, edgy games need bestiality. That's why some got 6 dollars chocolate. <laughs> With the money bags delivered, we visit Torn, who has a new mission for us. This one we need to save Bin, the IT guy, from a metalhead ridden strip mine. It's quite a jumpy guy, but we get him out of there, into a portal right next to him. 
Well, that's convenient. Just as we go back, Bin has a mission for us. We need to destroy some metalhead eggs sucking out Eco from the drill platform, which is another place you can only go to through the portal. This is one mission that most of the community don't like. And why? Because there's no checkpoints. It's also a fairly lengthy mission since you need to go into different turrets and shoot down the eggs. If you die, you get sent right back to the beginning, and it can be really discouraging for first time players. And also, it's easy to die. You can't nail the spinning metal heads. There's some metal heads with the shield. There's flying metal heads. You can shoot away parts from a walkway. So, for the newbies, expect to die. We return to Torn, but the KG chases us and shows us how bad they are using your eyes. He says we need to go back to the pumping station in order to check up on a friend from when he served in the KG. We meet this person, but the let's arrive and give the three of them shit. Then we kill them, she goes as a security pass and reveal herself as Ashlyn. She also says that we can talk to some old lady about the bazaar, about the seal of the House of Mar, which is the thing Ashlyn went out to investigate. I think, or something. We go over there and she's a mute and blind person with a translator who's um, some kind of monkey bird. Just, well, just look at the beak. We need to go into the Precursor Mountain Temple in order to get free artifacts. Odin shows us that blind and mute people can count, and we have to have to get them. It's a nice level, mostly because it's open. You have free things to get, and you have free pathways, there's no order to it, which is kinda neat. Also, this is the only part in the game you can encounter a rhino melhead. I think it's a rhino anyway. We get the stuff and return to Vin. We ask him if he can turn on the elevator, and he can, if we turn on a few switches hidden beneath some turrets. We do that, and we go to the palace. This is one of my favorite missions in the game, and it has to do with the view. Some odds may look kinda weird, but it's still a very nice mission. We get to the palace roof and overhear a conversation between the Baron and the Melhead leader. Basically, the Baron gives the Melheads just enough eco in order to make the Melheads attack Haven City just enough so that the Baron will stay in power. We end the conversation, and we hear that the Baron plans to backstab him. Also, Ashlyn is the Baron's daughter. Oh no! We proceed, and in a matter of 10 seconds, the Baron went into a machine and flew up to the roof. Oh, these people can be fast too. We engage in our first boss fight. And it's hard! The first and second phases are simple to grasp, you just need to shoot the machine every once in a while. But in the third phase, things just become cruel. He has two annoying attacks. The first one is that he wraps into you. The second one is an attack where the machine realizes it's a red tornado. These moves can be very difficult to dodge. You're sure to be hit if you're close, and if you're too far away, the camera will get obscured in some way. The dark powers I gave you can't protect you forever! Since I made you, I can destroy you. We'll meet again soon! Dirty? No. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Baron Praxis lives with Dictate another day, and we return to Torn, who's pissed at us. We tell Torn and Kor about what we overheard, and now we do a taxi mission. Clearly, this was meant to be our destiny. After that, we are tasked with returning to Dead Town, because Melheads are going to a sacred site. Torn gives us the walking barrel, and we proceed to Dead Town. We kill the enemies and go further until we see. Is that. Is that. No, it couldn't be. That's not- It's Samos' hut. But what? How? When? Where? Why? We're in the future, Dax. This horrible place is our world. Yes, this place is in the future. But we can't think about that now, because we have to return back to Torn. And he thinks it's finally time for us to meet the Shadow, who is the underground leader. The Shadow turns out to be... Samos? How? And he looks younger. And he doesn't know who we are, and he's just the past version of the same as isn't he? Jack tries to remind them, but he just thinks we're high. We're sent to the Haven Forest, which is accessed through the Precursor Mountain Temple. We are supposed to track down and kill five Melhead Scouts. Luckily for us, the mechanic from the stadium gives us the jet board, which makes this mission a breeze. After that, Ashling is doing a job and Melheads get in the city for some reason. And I think there's been talked about before, but within the walls of the city, there's supposed to be a shield which weakens the Melheads. If they were in here with the same amount of power as they had outside, then either the shield had been temporarily shut down, which Win would have noticed, or the developers overlook this fact. Also, it's very far in the city, it's not close to the wall and everything. The Melheads die and we leave to do a jet board mission. And then, we head to crew. That's a new mission for us. Crew wants us to free lurker slaves so that they will get paid. Yeah, in this game, lurkers have become somewhat peaceful and intelligent to some degree. However, the KG used them as slave labor, because that's what the future needs. And even though they gave us so much shit in the previous game, Jack legitimately wants to do something about it. We rescue three of them, and we head over to the bazaar, where we talk to a lurker named Brother, who is running a bar. And I thought they were the slaves. Yeah, Brother here has a bar. Jack 2 logic at its finest. We help her out and return to Gru, which has another mission for us. We use the jet board to cross some pipes in the sewers to retrieve a key called the Ruby Key, from a statue left on there when Gru did a heist. 
Yeah. There was once a time where it fit out the door. We go down, take the key and go up. Then we return to the underground hideout and get the mission from Samos, where it tells us we escorted the kid to the power station. This kid named me the lost to the city, but we don't have enough time to do on that since the kid starts running, and so KG soldiers come out of nowhere. Luckily, we get into the power station, Cora is there and gives us a mission, where we go to the dig. Unluckily for us, we do one of the hardest missions in the game, just because it's close or whatever. We need to go through a chunk of the map on foot, and there's many KG soldiers dropping in from above. The towers on the truck ships are relentless, and in the water, there's a robot that kills you. And why will we do it? To get a piece of the Seal of Mar. Because that's what we're doing now. The best way to beat it, as far as I know, is to get on the jet point and hope you land on a good enough angle. In my case, I only spent about 10 minutes on this mission, but I remember spending a few weeks back in the day. We continue to postpone the dig mission by going over to the stadium, where we finally figure out that Kiri is behind the curtains. We chat a bit and we race in order to access the palace. We start in the class where we race, but we first get a nice view of the crowd and wow, just look at this chick. It looks like she has an epileptic seizure. We do the race, and it's terrible! Okay, you know, it's somewhat manageable, but the controls are not very reliable. And if you want to stay in first place, you need to do some jumps. And if I ever time anything wrong or hit a wall, you'll somehow die. We completed and crewed the master key we found in the sewers. Cool. We continue to postpone the dig mission in order to listen to Daxter telling us about what they dreamt about last night. Sig gives us a mission to go to Heavenly Forest and kill a bunch of metalheads with special camouflage, but we feel that we should risk the dig. The cool thing about the dig is that this area has two access points. The first one is via this hovercraft, and the other one is through the pumping station, which the game never says, which in some ways is neat. Anyways, we kill KGs and we grind on some wires. But that's all if they do the Haven Forest mission, and Sig wasn't kidding, these ones do have camouflage. But last thing here is that it's not only one color metalhead, and if you don't concentrate, then this is pretty much a hide and seek mission, until you realize that the location of the metalheads are on the map. Then we head over to the power station, where Vin has bombs. He plans to detonate them in the strip mine due to some techno bubble stuff. However, hijinks ensue. Now we have about two minutes to place them. Cool! Core appears again in the power station and tells us we need to go to the drill platform in order to shoot down a ship. This mission isn't that durable due to the KG soldiers that pop up. They are all up in your face, and if you don't bring your A game to this mission, then your health will drop from top to bottom in a moment's notice. When we complete that, we visit Odin the Pecker, who tells us that we need to turn to the dig to get a piece of the Seal of Mar. This area does look quite different now. I don't know how it's changed so fast though. It must be all the gems. It's kinda nice, but what the fuck are those lurkers here? I know it's the place, but there's metalheads all over the place now, and those tanks more hits usually. Anyways, we get the seal piece and return to Tor, who says we need to take down five Hellcat cruisers, which is a reskin slash remodel of the ordinary cruisers, so I think, don't quote me on that. This is the one mission where the walking barrel is extremely useful, since the cruisers move all the time. We do that and return to Onen, who demands that he do a minigame. We press onward and the minigame someone reveals the third piece of the seed, the Mar which combines the seal pieces, and we take that that the three artifacts from before back to the Precursor Mountain Temple, where we put it in place. This reveals the Tomb of Mar, where Precursor Stone is supposed to be. It's mentioned at some parts in the story before, but I do my reviews my way. We enter the Tomb of Mar, and Samos, Kor, and the kid is there. Apparently, we need to send a kid in there, since he's the heir to the throne. However, he's too young, so Jack and Dax to go in there before the door closes, then freeze, and then we start. This is probably my favorite mission in the game. It's a more puzzle based level. This area had quite a bit of platforming in there. It's a very varied mission, which makes things a bit more enjoyable. When we reach the end, we are greeted by Baron Praxis, who tries to take the stone. A boss battle ensues, and the Baron shows us how good he is at multitasking. He gets the precursor stone and flees, and when we get out of there, we return to the underground hideout. Thor says that he snitched to the Baron holding Ashland more or less hostage. Power of the year, ladies and gentlemen. Not only does the Baron have the stone, but it's also captured most of the main underground people. They bring Hell Captain in the fortress, and at this point, a new cut of KG soul. Is introduced. We take a few more hits, and that's basically it. Don't know why they're introduced now, story wise, but something, something. <laughs> we go to the fortress only to find Tess, Samos, and Samos. Yeah, the old Samos we know is also here, but before we get to question what's going on, we flee into a conveniently placed portal. Oh, and by the way, this is the area from the start of the game. Neat. We escape and return to the underground hideout where the two Samos says we need to destroy some blast bombs, which is basically a spider tank. No, oh, not that spider tank. Then we return to the stadium. Arrow comes and does his stuff. Kira has the house for Arrow for some reason, and she's a complete bitch to Jack. Even though she should know why we do the things we do in the game, but fuck that. Jack is pissed that he leaves. Daxter is still here, and the class 2 race is about to begin. We begin to do that. HOLY CRAP, THIS IS TOO MUCH! I don't know why it's so much more difficult here. Is it the track? Is it Daxter? I don't know! 20 minutes later, we succeed, and Jack comes back to congratulate them, because this mission clearly warranted a character arc. 
we go to crew space, and since it's three being six, so for boring shit, crew wakes up and tasks we go to the sewers and going back to the statue with, with three people I don't give, really give a shit about. We should be a walk in the park, right? I mean, the elevator down to the statue is pretty close, right? No! If I spent a few weeks on the sealed this mission back in the day, then I have been stuck on this mission a few months! This mission is terrible! Is what I would have said if I didn't clear it in about 10 minutes. I know it's hard, but when you know what to do, it's a complete cakewalk. I did die, but all those two times. Just keep close to the group and try to kill the metalheads before Ray in company with close to you. And during the part where the metalheads all swarm you at once, you scatter gun and just go back and forth while shooting. We eventually get to the statue once again, but these people blow it up, reveal the horror mar. It's some kind of jam or something, ugh. And right after doing this mission that mostly everyone agrees is too hard, we get the Peacemaker. Don't you just love how timing works? We return to crew and it's put money on Errol to win the class 1 race. We say fuck that and Errol shows up the challenge just to erase the problem of the city. I use most of my time on this rather than the sewer escort mission. At least due to Errol liking to push people out of the way, combined with everything else. For some reason the sewer behaves like the vehicles in the stadium races. This makes me sad. But we eventually get through all and Errol's a whiny bitch. Now we need to go to Dead Town once again in order to visit the sacred site. However this time around we use the Titan suit. And it sucks! Slow moving, bad combat, and just generally awful. And it's even used in later missions. I will watch my opinions on that later, but know that this is not something that's pleasing. Now we get something called the Life Seed. We need to bring this thing to Young Sema so he might be able to get some green eco powers. Yep. We are the cause. Before that, we need to take the Onan. But even before that, we need to go to Strip Mine in order to take out a few Melhead eggs. Thankfully, it's nothing like the drill platform mission. Now we go to Onan. Now we meet Young Samus in Haven Forest. But when we try to do things, so KG soldiers arrive and give a shit. We die. Okay. Young Samus asks the plants, and the plants say that the Baron plans to crack the Precursor Stone. And if that happens, Judgment Day happens. If we have more incentive to stop him. If we didn't free some more sleeves. Okay, now we're going somewhere. It's in the damn Titan Suit! This mission involves us breaking some doors and such, but it feels worse than the first Titan Suit mission. We blow some control center shit at the drill platform, and the class 1 race begins. Oh boy! We get it, go and trip their pals if we win. And this is the easiest one. I cleared on the first try, so I think I did something right. And about 10 seconds in, someone had a hard time. Just look at the map! Anyway, we win and get the prize. However, the Baron spots us a few seconds too late. He rolls a prick, and he dies. Supposedly. Ah, who am I kidding? Of course he's dead. He, he couldn't have survived that. We go to the palace again, this time through the front door, and Ashley doesn't even know what's going on. She contacts Finn and questions him, and we get a final security pass. This time for a place close to the gate, which is the place the Baron visited recently. And since everything has been cleared up, we need to go through the palace, because why not? I like this mission, mostly because it's unlike any other area in the game. We have the platforming with the view of the city, we have the throne room, we have rooms that really look nice, along with turrets, and that's about it. We go to a weapon factory close to the deck, and it's not enjoyable. It's only visually distinctive, but some parts will make you die, at the very least lose some health. Oh no, you lose health in the game, oh no! We make it to the top, and crew is here. He tells us about the semen he releases due to them sexy weapons. It gives us a tainted damage upgrade to our weapons and tells us to scram, but we say NAY! So, boss battle time. He sends out mini crews, and when they die, the crew comes with a blaster. The fight can be challenging, but it shouldn't be too difficult. Just use the scary gun on mini crews and have the blaster or peacemaker on crew. We shoot down crew and take the heart of Mar back from him. That's nice. The crew puts on a countdown on the bomb, but thankfully Ashley saves us from the explosion. The crew is dead and we return to crew's place, and it turns out that crew hid something within Wackahead. We do that then get something called a time map, and suddenly Melhats arrive inside the city. Tess says that Sig went with the Ruby key into the underport. We go outside and then contacts us, saying that the shield for the wall has been sabotaged by Kor before getting ambushed. We head to the underport and God, I hate this mission. This is easily within the top 3 worst missions in the game. You're in the Titan suit, but on a worm, which means you're in Iron Boots mode. The suit is also constantly leaky, so you need to constantly refill air by going above water when the game allows it, or extending these special areas. You can't exit the suit, and there's these special squid metal heads which come in from above. The area is small, meaning that the camera can't really focus on the enemies as gracefully as you want it to. There's also mines that can somewhat uh, home in you. They move towards you, but they can't really move that far because of the chain. However, with the occasional rebel on the ground, you need to jump. And just look at the shape of the mine! It's more likely to hit it if you jump. Thankfully, that's only part of one of the missions. 
But the second part, we find Sig, who says the crew duped him. Using the Ruby Key, Bemo heads us easy passage into Hidden City, and with the Shield Wall being sabotaged by Core, the city is easy pickings. But wait, how does Sig get in? The Titan Soup was at the beginning of the level, and you can't get it from the end, and THAT'S NOT A DUNK! There's also a huge male head chasing, but it's fine. I'm getting some Cave of Bad Dreams flashbacks, but it's fine. We get to the end, then. Oh. Well, shit. I didn't know we were playing a Walking Dead game. But We head over to the stadium, and hey, a plot point is getting lower. Throughout the story, Kira has been working on a new and improved time machine. Items such as the Harmar and the time map are things that are necessary to complete the time machine. And now, it's complete. The two same must carry it across the stadium to a lurker balloon, since we need a rift gate in order to make it work. And wouldn't you know, it's in the middle of the Melhead nest. We need to protect these guys from the Melheads. Okay, after that, a dying bin requests us to go to the construction site, a one of area which exists because of reasons. We see the Baron with some KG soldiers and Korn drops in from the sky. And do you know why he does all this shit? Because he's the Melhead leader. This guy's just an old man. It's somewhat foreshadowed earlier. Plus he's really wanted to be close to the kid throughout the story. That fucking creep. The Melhead leader, referred to as Melkor, kills the Baron and the KG soldiers and leaves. When Melkor goes back to the nest, the bearer is barely holding on, and reveals the bomb the precursor stone resides in. We get the stone out and leave. Now that everything has gone to shit, we need to go to the Melhead nest in order to kill Melkor. We take the aircraft and, damn, this is a place. Even though there's several Melheads here, it's really no biggie. We go up and fire a gun that Mar built before they died. He didn't use it though. A crew mentioned this fact earlier and all, but question. Why didn't the Melheads dismantle it or at the very least turn it around? We proceed, see some new kind of Melheads and arrive at the area where Melkor resides. Melkor reveals that the kid is a young Jack, and because we've been tainted by the Eco, the stone won't open for us. This stone is a precursor egg, and if young Jack touches it, then the precursor awakens. Melkor blasts us, we survive, and final boss battle ensues. Core hangs from the ceiling via these things and shoots blasts out of his skull gem and gives birth during the fight. When you have the time, shoot Core. After two thirds of his health has dropped, he begins to battle on foot. He occasionally goes after you and uses an attack which I swear to god, what do I do? Like I'm seriously, I don't know what to do. Sometimes I get hurt, sometimes not. Core dies in an equally pathetic way as I fly on a bug sapper and a balloon crew arrive. When they arrive, old Samos says that young Jack and young Samos need to be sent back in time so that the events can transpire like they have, which means that the time machine that Kira built is the same as the time machine we used to get here. This raises a couple of questions, but now the young dudes are gone, and things happen. It turns out that Sig is alive, Onan is an alcoholic, and Samos and Packer know something that we never get to know because of reasons. Well, probably, we need to get to know it. In the never game, I win it. And that's Jack too. The story may be a hit or miss, and the difficulty may be a turning point for other players, but I love most of it. The main gameplay is the same, while the gunplay only adds good things. The levels, while many are repeated a few times, are good, not counting the checkpoint placement because fuck them. And the edginess is kinda admirable when you think about it. The setting may be different than before, but it only goes to show that things can still be good even though it's different. And strangely, this is my favorite Jack and Dexter game. It's a bit strange, because this is the last Jack and Dexter game that I picked up, so it's not nostalgia. I first picked up 1, then 3, and then 2. Of course, if any of you who haven't played Jack and Daxter want to pick it up, I will be prepared or get Jack 1 first. I know there are far more difficult games out there, but this one is pretty high up there. Of course, not harder than games like uh, Rayman 1 or such, but still pretty difficult. And just to add in a point at the end, the music is kind of forgettable. Some tracks are kind of nice to listen to, like the Palace one, and while well, the soundtracks builds up atmosphere, it's still nowhere as close as kind of like Rayman 2's building of atmosphere for me. Or just to keep it in Jack and Dexter, like Jack 1. Anyways, that's it. The next game I'll review is Jack 3, but as of now, I don't really know what to review after that. If anyone even watches this, please give a suggestion for a game, and I'll see if I own it. At the very least, I'll throw out a few games that I can think of. We got Ratchet and Clank, we got Kingdom Hearts, we got uh, Rayman 1, or probably our. Or just like, or probably, probably maybe two for PS1, the, like the rant video I talked about before. Uh, let's see here. We got some SNES mini stuff. Uh, actually, there's a game I owned before called The Emperor's New Groove for PS1. I actually kind of want to talk about it because I recently picked it up again. And yeah, it's probably some other, probably some other games in there. Anyways, the next review will of course be Jack 3. So we'll see you then.